Hello, my name is Matt Hussain. I'm a fine art portrait photographer. My work deals with issues around masculinity, femininity, representation, and today I'm talking about Moroni's The Tailor. My name is Priyash Mistry. I'm uh, an associate curator of modern and contemporary projects here at the National Gallery. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you here tonight to talk about this wonderful painting by Ramo uh, Moroni, a hugely iconic painting. Um, the tailor, and not only just to talk about one beautiful man, but three beautiful men in one evening. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us. Um, before I introduce um, tonight's uh, guest artist, um, I want to tell you a little bit about the series of Unexpected Views. So this is a series where um, we'll hold um, a talk every month where we invite an artist into the gallery to choose a painting from the collection and talk about it, but talk about their own work through the themes, the subjects, maybe the form of what that painting is, um, and therefore give you a totally unexpected view, uh, an unexpected reading of that work, but also tell you about how contemporary artists are working today. Um, before I, again, before I introduce Matt up, um, I should also thank uh, Hiscox uh, for their support for this evening as the contemporary art partner for the modern and contemporary program here at the National Gallery. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to hold these talks and we wouldn't be able to record them, so you wouldn't be able to use them as a resource online uh, later on. Um, so without further ado, um, please uh, join me in welcoming Matab Hussain. Um, Matab is an artist who uh, now lives and works in London. He was born in Glasgow and grew up in Birmingham. Um, and actually, I first encountered Matab's work when um, on the occasion of his exhibition in 2017 at Autograph BP, yeah. uh, where he showed a series of um, his series called You Get Me, um, which we'll touch on later tonight, so I won't describe it so much now. Um, and Autograph BP is this fantastic photography organisation um, and gallery based in East London. And it, was, um, and it was great to see his work then, and I've followed his work ever since. Um, Matab um, has had an interest in photography from quite an early age, but actually earned an MA in photography in uh, 2013 from Nottingham Trent University. And previous to this, actually, Matab studied art history, both at Goldsmiths and City University here in London, um, and actually had a career working in museums. So Matab worked next door to us at the National Portrait Gallery for a few years. Um, his uh, art practice since, so since this change in career, uh, has engaged with subjects um, around identity, cultural heritage, um, and society, using photography and portraiture as a method to challenge those prevailing concepts of multiculturalism. Um, Matt has been the recipient of numerous awards and uh, commissions and has exhibited in fantastic uh, galleries right across the UK. I'm only going to name a few, so including the Icon Gallery in Birmingham, New Art Exchange in Nottingham, and uh, the New Art Gallery in Warsaw. Um, in 2016, he was awarded the Discoveries Art Award in, uh, at Houston Photo Fest. Uh, and his recent photo book, um, this book, You Get Me, it's right way up, um, published by Mac Books was awarded the Light Work Photo Book Award in 2017. So please join me in welcoming uh, Matab Hussain uh, this evening for tonight's conversation. Um, so to begin, I think I want to ask Matab, why did you choose this painting out of all of the paintings in the gallery? Um, well, you know, we, we met and I met with Joseph and we wandered around many of the rooms, um, looked at Holbein's, Titian's, Velazquez, and I was walking around and studying art history. I was, you know, I was met by so many familiar paintings, but nothing was really kind of like really hitting me. And I thought, oh man, and what am I going to find? And I was kind of thinking, well, maybe I'll pick this portrait. But then Joseph said, why don't we just come into room 12? And when I walked into room 12, I was literally drawn to this beautiful man. And it was so striking, and it kind of really resembled my own work. And I thought, God, I've got to talk about this one. And it was almost this idea of kind of falling in love with him, actually. Uh, so it's, it's, it's such a beautiful portrait. And in a way, you know, the, the gaze is so direct. 
that kind of locking of the eyes, that you know we had to have a conversation. And it, of course, it's a very, very famous portrait, but I think there's a reason why it hits home with so many people. Yeah. So interestingly, this painting by Moroni is the first painting by Moroni to enter the collection. So the National Gallery owns the largest number of Moroni works outside of Italy. We have about 11 paintings in the collection. And this work was bought in the middle of the 19th century by our director then, Charles Eastlake. And actually, even his wife at the time, Lady Eastlake, said that uh, at the time of this acquisition that this painting is going to be very popular. Mm. And you can utterly see why, mm. right? Because he is not only a beautiful man, but he's got this direct gaze with you. Yeah, and it's, it's confident. It's really sexy. They, and it appeals to both men and women. Uh, you know, of course, the female gaze fell in love with him, but the, as a man, I look at him and I think, gosh, that, that slight aggression and that slight arrogance is just enough for me to kind of desire to be like him. And it's the way that I try and make the work in my portraiture is to allow these men to kind of really hold themselves in a very dignified way. And what's fantastic is that this chap is an artisan. He's a working class tailor. And Moroni has managed kind of, I think, quite cleverly positions him as, an, as a noble sitter, which is how I've been making my work. My work is about British, brown, Muslim men, very working class, and I position them in museum and gallery spaces deliberately because I know the power of these rooms by working previously at the National Portrait Gallery. Um, I worked as a designer and a kind of a design assistant, and one of the things being in that department meant that I worked with so many different departments, one of which was the 16th and 17th century uh, curators, and every morning, at eight o'clock, I'd, I'd cycle into the gallery and I'd walk around changing the captions with the curators or working with the art, um, art handling team, moving around the, the paintings. And I was always, always be the first one there. So I'd always have this experience of walking in an incredibly grand space. And at first, you know, you, you do feel when the locking of the eyes of these portraits, mm. the slight level of inferiority, like you, you feel kind of quite small, but you've, you've noticed that power and I think that had a really profound effect on my, on my portraiture. And it's why it was, it was important for me as an artist to be, when I did start exhibiting my work, was to exhibit in museum and gallery spaces because it's propaganda at the end of the day. And I'm, and I'm playing with propaganda, really. So, I mean, I could talk more about it. And, yeah. yeah, well, I wanted to talk a little bit about this series of work. Yeah, sure. Um, so this is a, uh, a series um, called You Get Me. And it was predominantly shot in Birmingham. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, do you want to describe it? You approached... Yeah, so You Get Me, it, yeah. to get it to the stage of a book took nine years. Um, I would say in terms of making my work, oh, it took sorry. about six years and then kind of pushing it. But ultimately, um, as a, you know, working in museum and galleries, I felt incredibly invisible. I love these spaces, but I never saw myself reflected. So uh, when I did kind of jump ship, and it was, I only jumped ship out of frustration, because I really thought as an art historian that I would find those artists that were making work that was relevant to my experience, but because I wasn't finding it, and the work that I was seeing was quite ghettoized, I thought, I'm gonna have to make it. So, yeah. so while I was at the National Portrait Gallery, I went, you know, I used to go back home where I grew up, which was in Birmingham, and I'd cycle the streets, I'd walk the streets, and I would find people on the streets. And that's when I started to kind of learn my skill as a portraitist. And, and as I started making the work, they were always three quarter length. Mm. Um, the backdrops, at, you know, were as quite muted as I could get. There would be brick walls, or there'd be the greens of the trees. They, and, and, and for me, when I met someone, I always had to kind of be attracted to them. That was the key quality in, in my kind of editing. It was like, are you beautiful enough for the audience <laughs> to kind of fall in love with you? And, and that's, and it, cause it's so important, I think, because, you know, with regards to, you know, the British Muslim experience, they've been under such attack. Mm. And over the last 20 years, the narrative has been completely hijacked. And so these men that you see in these books or the men that you see in the galleries, they are labelled as terrorists or terrorist sympathisers or sexual groomers, or they might kill their sisters in the name of honour. This is the level of 
media propaganda and pressure that this community has been under. And the work that you see in the press or on television has always reinforced that narrative. So what I wanted to try and do was kind of use the same medium of photography and what use landscape instead of portraiture and kind of have that intervention. And the only way that I was really going to do that was to be able to put them in a space as quiet as this, mm. a space that ultimately is, ex when you exhibit, is, runs for at least two to three months, and a space that you can really gaze and have an unspoken conversation. Mm. So, and this is what happens with Moroni's portrait, the tailor, you have this unspoken conversation. So. One thing I think is really interesting about, I mean, there's a few copies of the book um, tra traveling around at the moment, but you, um, as you turn through the pages and then you get this immediate gauge, engagement with the, the figure mm. and you get this confidence, mm. this immediate sense of confidence that comes through. Mm. And I wondered how you sort of started that conversation with them and how you got these men mm. um, into this particular point of actually engaging with, the, with you as a photographer, yeah. and then how that then translates to another, to an audience. Obviously. Yeah. Well, you know, we all know that portraiture has a three-way relationship between artist, sitter, and spectator. And I was very aware of that. I, of course, we all experience it when we, as museum and gallery visitors. So when I met these men on the streets, I would say to them, look, you know what you're being labelled as. I can put you on a gallery wall and we can have a different conversation. And so how do you want to hold yourself in a gallery space? Now, chances are most of the men I photographed never visited a gallery space, but they understood the power of those spaces. So I gave that responsibility to them. And I always say, um, I'm not taking your portrait, I want to make your portrait. This is a collaboration. Mm. So that responsibility then falls on them. And of course, you know, there are moments where people want to pose a certain way. It might kind of reference towards fashion photography. But I moved to digital kind of two years into my practice. And what was fantastic about moving into digital was that three-way relationship got shifted, whereas they were no longer the, the, the subject, the sitter. When, you, when they looked at the screen, they became the audience as well. So then we had a very critical discussion about which mm. one works, which one doesn't work. And as a result, they were happy with their portrait. And I would also give them a digital copy of their portrait. As I've given books to the sitters. And it's a collaboration because I know if I'm making work about the British Muslim experience, if I don't get it right, I will be shut down very quickly in my community. Mm. So I had to represent honestly and fair, fairly. So it was about all these exchanges. But also, you know, anyone loves to be, to be kind of adored and, mm. and photographed. So when they see this beautiful portrait, they can see the skill. And, and, and that's kind of how you do it. But it wasn't that easy. I, I got rejected probably 70% of the time. Yeah. So it was about being resist, resilient and just walking the streets and walking the streets. And I remember once um, I left my home in London, was in Birmingham for a whole week, and I was on the streets for probably eight to 10 hours a day. And for the whole week I was rejected up until Friday afternoon. And then Friday afternoon I got the most beautiful portrait and that was, I was, and it was worth the week. So it's about that process really, yeah. But also it's, um some of these portraits didn't happen immediately. No, no, yeah. So there's also that level of kind of building a relationship. With Completely, yeah. So some subject. portraits, you know, would have taken, yeah. I think, an exchange of five to 15 minutes. Yeah. And right. others, yeah. you know, th there would be conversations and yeah. my camera would never come out of my bag. Yeah. It was about getting to know you as a person and, 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 and for them to feel comfortable about what, who I am. Yeah. And, but then other, other times, I think one of my portraits took eight years to make. And it was because actually, I just wanted to know who this person was. I wanted to have a really strong relationship yeah. with this. And you just know, you just know that certain th moments aren't right to, to ask for a portrait. So this idea of not rushing. And I guess in a way, very much like a painter, when a painter paints someone, they get to know them in a very, very intimate way. It takes a long time. So it's about having that type of rapport, which I think in the end, and we know that Moroni actually painted from life. Mm. You know, and that's how you were able to then get this sort of, 
this uh, really interesting quality in his portraits where he, it captures this sort of fleeting moment. Mm. Um, and it became a quality that you can recognize in actually a lot of his portraits. His portraits became celebrated for having that sort of psychological dimension. Mm. And it's interesting as a sort of portraitist, mm. I mean, as an artist, but as a portraitist, you are able to kind of meet the challenge of a subject in that way. Yeah, completely. And I think that takes time. Yeah. And I think that's what's amazing about Moroni and his skill. He was able to switch that and not switch that. Yeah. So like this particular portrait has that quality about it. And there are so many portrait photographers. There are so many portraitists mm -hmm. with regards to the painting, but there aren't, I would say, that many who can have that, that almost unspoken portrait quality. Yeah. I mean, he really does, it, it really does feel like, you know, he's speaking to me or to you or mm. to us. And, you know, every time I think, when I was thinking about him this, this week and the power of his gaze, I, I got goosebumps. Yeah. And that is the power and that's the beauty of portraiture. And I think that's one of the reasons why I fell in love with it, because of that human experience. Yeah. One of the interesting uh, points about your work is that, um, you give a level of agency to the to your to the sitters to the subjects of the portraits, and you do that through, you know, choosing the most beautiful men, but also kind of presenting them in this, in the really most kind of the highest quality in the most in the kind of most beautiful way, mm. uh, in order to kind of then seduce a viewer, and then sort of hit them with the politics, if you will. Completely. And I wondered if we could kind of consider the same way of working with Moroni here, because this work is actually very unique in, in actually a lot of portraiture that was happening in the 16th century. Yeah. So you would normally commission a portrait if you were a nobleman, but actually it's clear that this sitter is, he's an artisan. Yeah, you know? I mean, and that was... But he's also chosen to be depicted while working, mm. you know. Um, mm. We know that he has a certain level of status within society because he's got this sword belt, mm. but then he's chosen not to wear his sword. So he's actually choosing how he wants to be presented and actually showing a level of confidence in that. Mm. So, you know, he's being shown with, his t with the tools of his trade, yeah. you know, not in the kind of decadent um, materials that he's actually using uh, and actually making the kind of costume and clothes things for his clients who are the noblemen of the society and um, he's kind of chosen how he wants to be presented. How did that exchange happen with the way that you were presenting you uh, when you had this exchange with your sitters? I mean how much did they kind of sort of say okay hang on give me like five minutes and then come back dressed in something else or? No I think um, yes there was a couple of times and that was kind of more at the end of the series so the way I work is that um, I, I kind of build a color palette. That's how I've always said to myself, I build a very big color palette and that means building a big archive. Mm. And then when I go home, that's when I edit. And that's for me a type of painting. And um, so that's how I would choose the sitters. But then I also deliberately looked for sitters who were wearing red, white and blue the, the idea of the Union Jack. So when you look at the, the series, there's a lot of men who are pretty much uh, wearing the flag, the British yeah. flag. And it was deliberate to show that these guys are British. Yeah. They, you know, we're, we're co they're constantly asked, are you British, are you Muslim, are you Pakistani, are you Bengali? But actually, I, I was trying to strip all that away and say, actually, they're hybrids. And so that's how I kind of was choosing. And in terms, of, in terms of how they were holding themselves, I control that a lot. And it was deliberate because I wanted to pay homage to 16th and 17th century court paintings. But what I allowed them to do was feel confident enough and, and, and um, relaxed enough to give me that tiny bit of arrogance, that tiny bit of aggression um, and assurance. And, and for them to feel like they're proud. Because I said, look, you guys are doing amazing. Under this pressure, you are holding yourself so well. Let's try and celebrate that. Yeah. And, and, that's, and I think by, 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 by saying that, by being this kind of mentor, by, you know, who said, I'm going to champion this, I'm going to help challenge this, these stereotypes, it, it, it happened. And it was magical. 
and you would and I would see it. Yeah. I would see it. So yeah. Can we talk a little bit about the format of the work? So you yeah. mentioned that um, you show them in a gallery, so you show them as prints yeah. on the wall, um, and you shoot digitally, so you can kind of edit in a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, but then also you produce this very beautiful book. Yeah. Um, and in the book, you, you feature also a little bit of text, so mm -hmm. quotes from some of the sitters. Mm -hmm. They're not identified about uh, you know, who the kind of quotes are from. Yeah. And on the back cover, interestingly, what you've done is you put the, um, these headlines, the kinds of headlines you just spoke about, mm. um, just as the sort of back cover to this, to f sort of frame the yeah. discussion in a way. Yeah, can I, can, I gra can I grab a book? Is that all right? Thank you. So, I've, so over the 10 years, I did quite a lot of research, and I built this timeline looking at Muslim hysteria. And with Michael, we were trying to figure out how do we incorporate that in a book. And there was, so many, there was going to be so many ways of doing this. But ultimately, we decided that we were going to just put the dubious headlines on the back. And these are headlines that were, have been going on for the last 10, 15 years. And a lot of them are dubious. And it was to show that actually we've been psychologically played by the media. And we might not pick up the Daily Star. I'm sure none of you in this room read the Daily Star. However, when you're buying your groceries, when you're next to the checkout, all the headlines are right there. So when you're waiting and you're, you're looking around you're, until it's your turn, you're reading these headlines. And there's, some of these are blatant lies. I mean, the Leveson Inquiry picked out some of these, and, and there were just mm -hmm. lies. I mean, I'd lo love to just kind of read one, one which says, Muslim thugs aged just 12 in knife attack on Brit schoolboy. Now, when you read that headline, you kind of think it's a British English kid and a British Muslim kid. But actually, they're both British Muslim. And these, these are the types of headlines that we've been fed. So I wanted to kind of cement that as a, as a, as a part of showing the kind of evidence um, of what's, what's been happening, really. And, and with regards to the quotes in the book, these were separated. So one section would talk about masculinity. Another section would talk about 9-11 um, conspiracy theories. And I wanted to keep it anonymous because I wanted it to be more of a collective voice rather than one individual. Mm. And of course, there's an essay explaining why I did the, did the work, really. So yeah. 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 And could you talk a little bit about the landscape? Oh, yeah, sure. Because well? yes. usually, what's interesting about the, the um, Moroni works in sort of certain formats, yeah. as we can see along the wall as well. Um, he had three quarter length portraits as well as sort of um, head bust kind of mm. size portraits, um, and occasionally full length portraits as well. You've chosen to actually sh switch that around. Yeah. So actually, you don't sh present your portraits as portrait yeah, frames, but yeah. you make them into landscape. Yeah. Um, and again, that was very deliberate, because I, wanted, I knew that it was going, the work was going to translate very well on television, very well on, um, on, on, um, in, in newspapers or on the t computer screens there where we consume these types of, types of images. And I wanted to talk, talk about the idea that we are so um, invisible yet hyper-visible. And it was to kind of talk about this idea that I've never really seen myself reflected. Mm. I've never seen myself on a billboard um, advertising the clothes that these young men are wearing. And, and also on television, when I do see myself on television, it's always very ghettoizing as well. I mean, when I look at this portrait, I think mm. he, could be, uh, he could be advertising for Adidas. Mm. You know, this, and this is what these guys want. And these were the conversations that were taking place when I was meeting these men. They were like, oh, so you're a photographer. Um, can you get me into modeling? You know, and it was this desire to be desired. That's all it was because they wanted to see themselves and be seen as beautiful rather than invisible or savages or dirty or th a threat. This is the, the reality of what has happened in our society. Mm. And so it's, it's, it's all, so the politics are there, right? So please, you know, fall in love with them. And once you fall in love, then I'm gonna hit you hard with the politics mm. because then you're open to it. Whereas before you're not. So that's kind of my propaganda, which is, you know, fall in love, put it in a beautiful space, and then we can have a much bigger conversation. And I wonder if Moroni was actually possibly doing the same thing with this portrait in a way, because, so 
um, Moroni wasn't part of the sort of metropolis areas in Italy. So, you know, he he was in um, Bergamo, in Brescia, and these kind of very provincial towns. Yeah. And that's where he practiced. And and actually, you know, it's interesting that you're shooting in Birmingham mm. and not London. Mm. You know, and yeah. having that kind of relationship with a, you know the kind of not necessarily the nobility or the kind of a higher you know the higher levels of society but actually the you know you're very much talking about a working class identity yes you know yeah i am talking about working class identity but i think the luxury of being an artist is that you're able to be free from your own class system mm. and uh, you know one minute i could be in the deepest darkest parts of birmingham um, talking to someone who has the most hopelessness of experiences, mm. and then the next day I might be sitting next to a curator, a curator or a collector. And so that kind of bridging of those two worlds was really interesting. And I think Moroni did the exact same thing. You know, he was playing on that. And that's why I love this portrait so much, because I can see that um, he, he, you know, I'm sure this tailor would have dressed him. I think that's how uh, uh, you know he, this tailor had this uh, moment for himself because he was also working in working as an artisan and he also was working with the upper classes. Mm. So here was a working class man who had to work incredibly hard for his trade, but then was able to kind of float around. Mm. So in a way, I think um, Moroni. I, I, th I feel like it's a self-portrait in a way. Well, that's what I was about to ask you about your portraits yeah. as a sort of collective mm. because you're very you know you are kind of talking about British Muslim men yeah and it is this kind of collective identity do you see it as a bit of autobiography in yeah auto totally auto of course portraiture? yeah of course and that's is because you know I see myself in all of them and in a way when you're attracted to someone it's because you want something from them so yes yeah, it is autobiographical in the sense that this is kind of my experience too mm but I've had the luxury of wanting to be an artist and being able to kind of play in different spaces and using that power, because it is a power being an artist. And it's an, it's an incredible privilege to be able to kind of walk in these spaces and feel like they're yours to play with. So yeah, of, co of course, it's, it's, and I don't think that would have happened if I didn't work in these spaces and got to know the, the people behind the scenes mm. who are my friends. And, and and knowing that yes, we can have a different conversation, and I can bring working class brown men into a space like this, just as Moroni has done, and shake it up. And I would say, you know, the tailor, he's owning this space way more than anyone else in this room. I mean, you are completely drawn to him because he is different, because he has that that confidence about him. It's not, it's it's a kind of slight aggression that confidence, and you know, it's not all flares with you know, all, you know, all their garments, mm. and it's just him in his rawest sense, really. And actually, throughout the sort of, throughout the last sort of century and a half, in a way, since the work has entered the collection, there's been many sort of accounts of how different people have had this sort of love affair with the tailor, mm. which I find really fascinating, because it still echoes today, you know. Um, the our artists who kind of are so enamored by this painting that they create sort of newer, updated versions. Somebody said you could put him in a, um, a in polar a, neck, in a polar neck yeah. and, and it could be, um, you know, uh, uh, another, uh, you know, a man from contemporary society that's just there to seduce you all over again. <laughs> Which I, I, but one thing I was going to ask you is about the legacy of your portraits. And that's, mm. so firstly, the kind of response mm. that you've had. So we know that the work, the series has been hugely successful. The book is, um, Apps, you know, has been published and critically acclaimed, but, yeah. and the exhibitions has been fantastic. But what's been the reception from, you know, the the sitters or uh, generally in the kind of in 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 the public? In yeah, I mean, you know, I, like like I said, it took nine years to get to a show, and I, believe me, I pushed for it mm. way before that. But I think, you know, it was kismet, right? It was destiny that it all happened at the right time. You know, we had Brexit, we had Trump. And people were, and racism was just kind of popping its head up again, and so people were ready for a very different conversation. So when the show did open up, uh, autograph ABP, um, I had to make a decision. I was like, Am I going to do the art speak? Am I going to be an academic with the work, or am I just going to be very honest and real? 
So when, when, when it happened, when I had my first interview, I just knit rip. And I just talked about all the things that we've spoken about today, very honestly. Mm. And I think that really resonated with the, with the audience because here, we, here was someone else having a, here was someone having a really real conversation. And so as a result, it just rippled. And you know, within two months, we hit close to two million people online. Oh, wow. And we had all the press, you name it, we had it. We had over 600 people come to the opening. And, and I think the most beautiful comment I had was someone saying, I never thought these two worlds would ever come together. Mm. And that just sent shivers down my spine. And I thought, you know what, I'm, done. I'm happy. If that's, that's all I wanted to hear, I really wanted to bring my two worlds together too. Um, and yeah, it's been, it's been really well received. And, and I think in a way, and I hope as, as it continues that the work shows gets to sh be shown around the UK and we're talking about taking it to the US, that the, the men in these portraits become you know, a legacy and an icon in their own right and be immortalized just as, you know, the tailor is immortalized. I mean, I would say he's the envious, we are envy him so much in this room. He'll never go old. Uh, he will always be beautiful yeah. and he will always be desired. And that's the power of portraiture. And that's why I've fallen in love with being a portraitist, really. Can we talk about um, the next series of works that you're um, working on at the moment? So you are working on a series with women. Yeah. Um, how has that differed? What's the experience? Is the approach the same? Or? No, the approach has been very different. So the men, you know, men wander the streets, men hang out on street corners. It's, it's kind of what they do. And the women don't. The women go from A to B. And so I had to figure out, well, where, where do I hang and not look so sleazy? <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, I, so I ended up going to shisha lounges. So in Birmingham, there's a lot of shisha lounges that are kind of um, popped up over the last 10, 15 years. You know, before I, when I was socializing, they weren't around. So I would go to seashell lounges and I'd sit there and I'd take my books, I'd take my prints, and I'd sit down with these, you know, beautiful women and tell them I'm an artist and please help me <laughs> make, make some work. And, and, and other times I will go and do talks at colleges and universities, knowing that I will meet potential sitters and I've, and also Instagram's been an incredible mm. experience where I've put a, one of my portraits up and said, hey, who wants to be photographed for my new series? And yeah, you get kind of inundated and, you know, of course Instagram had its kind of um, slight problematic issues that you're only dealing with a certain demographic, but I'm kind of close to it. So it's, you know, everyone's always like, where are the women in all this? And I keep saying, oh, they're coming, don't worry. And actually the women are like fierce, far more stronger than the men. And um, so I'm really excited to kind of be able to bring that soon to, the, to an audience. Yeah. But in terms of how it's yeah. differed, um, of course I talked about the veil and then, and then kind of halfway through the, the work, I was like, why am I talking about the veil? This, this conversation's over. Yeah. Um, it's just pandering to the stereotype and we're just kind of refeeding the same beast. So now I'm finding like really sexy, edgy, powerful British Muslim women that you don't necessarily uh, see in the you know in mainstream media. Yeah. One of which is Farah, this beautiful woman who I photographed, and I've got her deliberately holding a cricket bat, really <coughs> talking about colonialism, and she looks fierce. Like you know, she's definitely you know going to cause a sensation when she's you know put in a gallery space. Yeah. And again, it's about wanting the audience to kind of fall in love with them. Um, before we um, close off, I wondered if you could just touch on You Get Me as yeah. a title. Yeah. Uh, because that's one of the things that really struck me with the series is that you're confronted by these men and you're kind of seduced by these men. Yeah. And then suddenly you're in dialogue with them. Yeah. And then You Get Me is a really interesting way of kind Crazy, of... Yeah. yeah. So um, getting into that conversation completely, and it was it was it, the title came about when I re-listened to all my interviews, and every other sentence, these young men would say, "You get me, you get me," and I was like, "Oh my god, that's the most amazing thing! That's the most amazing title because yeah. it really talked about this idea of vulnerability. Like these men, they do come across as powerful and confident, but actually inside they're struggling, and it was almost this idea: Well, do you really understand me? Do you really know where I'm coming from? And it was that vulnerability aspect to it that I was really drawn to. But also the idea that because 
the British Asian experience yeah. has not been kind of openly reflected in society, these young men have had to latch onto other marginalized communities, yeah. one of which is the black experience and the black community. So there were a few people you know, who said, well, why are you referencing a black phrase? Um, and I say, no, this is about urbanism. And this is about, yeah. you know, that, that fact that they are, they're trying to kind of find a space. And, yeah. you know, you get me says it all really. It's like, and that's why we deliberately um, put it on his, near his heart. And it was him trying to speak to you really. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting that you talk about that in a, um, uh, in a way that you, uh, in this kind of response to multiculturalism in a mm. way. So you talk about the kind of, I guess it's kind of this failure of how those kind of rhetorics and that kind of discourse existed, mm. uh, you know, was sort of proliferated in a way. Yeah, yeah. Know, and it really marginalised a, a lot of people. Yeah, it did. And I think, you know, the, the sad reality is that, um, you know, before 9-11, we had, we had so yeah. many amazing crea creators coming through and I think that really shifted the conversation. People then had to somehow decide yeah. what they were gonna be. And a lot of these musicians, a lot of these producers that were coming through, it's interesting, they kind of shut, they shut back yeah. and, and they stopped creating. And they um, almost went, went back to their religion as a form of feeling safe. Yeah. And, it's, and, and I think it's taken a long time uh, for people like myself to feel like they can now come forward again yeah. and feel like they can be part of society and have that social exchange. And yeah, that's, that's it really, I think. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, so please join me in um, thanking Matab uh, for joining us this evening. <laughs> and thank you for watching. If you'd like to know more, please follow the link below.